How you doing, everybody? Welcome back to Before I Forget. This is my video channel, inspired by my Instagram channel, 1985 Road Dog. Uh, haven't done a video in a while. Well, it's a little bit. Uh, I'm working on a lot of other stuff right now, so it's tough for me to just sit down and just talk when I'm be able to be quiet and alone and stuff. I've got cats running around, so they get in the mix sometimes. Somebody saw that uh, on my last video. Um... Yeah, hey, I'm wearing a t-shirt here from uh, my friend Didi. Uh, Didi was here uh, on Instagram. Uh, check her out. She's a great artist, street art, uh, really cool stuff. Um, and she's hip to what I'm doing and, and uh, knows a lot of the same people. So uh, it's all cool. Didi was here. Thanks for the shirt, Didi. Uh, this episode here, I'm going to talk about sweet pain. <clears throat> I've been avoiding this for a while because it's, you know, it's a touchy subject for a lot of people. Sweet pain. Um, so if, if you don't know a little bit more about my background, I'll fill you in. So I worked for uh, a record distributor back in uh, 1979. I started working for a record distributor called Important Record Distributors. They were an import record distributor. They imported European um, foreign music into America and sold those releases to record stores here in America. And you have to understand, 1970, 1980, 81, there were thousands of record stores, thousands. So the uh, competition was heavy. And uh, having import product gave your store some flavor, you know, it gave you stuff that other people might not have had, uh, you know. So this company imported all kinds of stuff, um, you know, you name it. They, the, the, the distributor eventually became Relativity Records. They started their own label. So they had important record distributors. They had Relativity Records, which was a label that focused on all kinds of stuff, um, Started out doing some uh, dance music, uh, early 80s dance music out of Britain. Uh, eventually, you know, licensed a lot of stuff from Europe, Tangerine Dream Records. And uh, they did the Les Miserables soundtrack for the Broadway show, which was a huge seller. Um, they did, um, but they had a lot of indie stuff. Robin Hitchcock, Cocteau Twins, um, Thelonious Monster, Scruffy the Cat, Defenestration, The Dancing Hoods. Um, they licensed a lot of stuff from Europe, you know, just short-term licensing uh, deals. So they started their own label, uh, focusing on that music because they had the distribution in place, which made it very powerful. There were a lot of other distributors at the time that distributed import music, um, Peters International and Jam and uh, some smaller guys like Bonaparte. And there were other import distributors, but none of them were able to start a label that got them to eventually, eventually the Relativity uh, sold the whole shebang, Relativity, Combat, the distribution, they sold the whole thing to Sony for millions of dollars. None of these other distributors at the time went that way. They distributed product. They didn't start have their own labels. So Relativity started a, a label, really small, very, very, very small. Um... You know, eventually Relativity put out Joe Satriani, Surfing with the Alien was a big record for them. Um, uh, I was working for the label at the time in 87 when Satriani was being worked. I was the director of promotions for Relativity. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back. So 79, 80, 81, I'm working for this record distributor, important record distributors. So they started Relativity and they also started Combat, which was a, a, a thrash metal label, really. They didn't call themselves a thrash metal label, but that's the kind of bands they signed on Combat. Um, you know, Combat, um, you know, uh, let me back up a second even more. So rel important record distributors had done a P&D deal, pressing and distribution deal with Megaforce Records. So they would, they would press and manufacture the records for Megaforce, and then they would distribute and market the records into the marketplace for Megaforce. They had an exclusive deal with Megaforce. And of course, the big Megaforce band was Metallica. Uh, and they also had, uh, I don't know if they had Anthrax. I can't remember. They had um, uh, maybe maybe the Megaforce people, John and Marsha Zazula, they might have managed Anthrax. But I don't know if they were on Megaforce records. Uh, Exciter, I think Exciter was another Megaforce band. But the big one was Metallica. 
So they're just important record distributors is, is, has the exclusive distribution on this first Metallica, first couple Metallica albums. Even Ride the Lightning originally was an independent through Megaforce and then it got picked up by Elektra. So the first two Metallica records were being worked and, and sold through important record distributors and they were selling all tons of them because Metallica and thrash and that real street metal was the thing, was what was happening. So... Um, Relativity decides to start their own thrash kind of label, Combat, uh, and their big signing was Megadeth, um, yeah, Killing My Biz Killing's My Business and Business is Good. That first Megadeth album uh, was on Combat. Um, actually, they did uh, Combat was set to release Peace Sells, but who's buying? But you know, Mustaine wanted off the label and. Uh, off of combat and they combat did the deal because combat owned the rights to the to the you know however many records deal they signed with megadeth five album deal six album deal so combat had to do a deal with capital and then peace sells who's buying came out on capital not combat but there was a combat mix um i think it was done by randy burns of peace sells who's buying um Anyway, so they had all this thrash stuff, Exodus, Possessed, Death, Combat had all these crazy thrash bands. I was working there at the time uh, uh, as, a, as a salesperson. Um, I started in the warehouse there and then I became a salesperson. And I was also DJing on the weekends at Speaks and Malibu and all these clubs. So I was living a crazy, crazy life from the get-go. Um, that record distributor and the labels Relativity and Combat, and uh, I'll call it IRD for short, important record distributors. There was crazy times, man. I mean, everybody that worked in there and everybody was doing drugs, selling drugs. You know, it was insane. I, 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 you know, it was it, it, the, the people that owned that, started that record distributor worked for other distributors through the years, um, Record Shack and people that sold top 40 music and whatnot and uh, 45 records of the top 100 hits to all the stores. So they, if you, you know, they were in that world of distribution. So there's a lot of craziness that went on in there. There's always a lot of drugs around. Um, uh, and so they started signing these bands and they're starting to really generate cash flow. Now, the guy that co-owned IRD and Relativity and Combat, the partner was a guy in England that had a distributor uh, in England called Winsong Records. So that's how we got all the imports and stuff from this guy in England at Winsong, who was very powerful. And then he got behind it. He eventually started, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Music for Nations, uh, the label uh, out of Winsong Distributor. So there's all this stuff going on. So I'm working there. I'm plugged into the music scene. I was, you know, screaming about Motley Crue's first album on Leather Records, uh, you know, all this stuff. So they they knew that I was A, a DJ, B, I worked there. I was really, really, you know, plugged into the music scene, whether it was New Wave and Disco or the New Wave of British Heavy Metal, the Iron Maidens and Saxons and Def Leppards and, and, and Samson and Angel Witch and all those bands. They knew I knew what was going on. So... The owner of Combat Records came to me one day and said, you know, we need a glam band. We want to do a glam band because they didn't have anything that was remotely close to that. So they had they had a band called TKO. Uh, this guy, Brad Sinsel, they had a band called TKO. I don't know if they were from Canada or not, but they were like more straight ahead rock, straight ahead hard rock. Um, Relativity also had the Talus record. Billy Sheehan, um, um, that first Talus record, I think Phil Narrow was the vocalist. Um, so they had some straight ahead rock and hard rock, but Combat became known for thrash metal because of Megadeth and Exodus and all these bands that really dominated that label at the time. Nuclear Assault, uh, uh, there's so many bands. So he came to me and said, hey, we, we need a glam band. And I'm like, well, everybody, this is like 1984. And he knows that I'm hanging out with Motley Crue, the owner. And he knows that, um, you know, I'm hanging out with Rat and all these bands. And I'm plugged into the scene and, and I know what's going on. He's like, we need to sign a glam band. I go, well, well, there really is nobody. 
Motley was signed, Rat was signed, Poison was signed, Wasp was signed. And you hadn't gotten, at that point, there was no second wave of L.A. stuff. There was no uh, L.A. guns and Guns N' Roses and and there was no a warrant and there was no, um, you know, that scene had happened yet. You're talking 84. All the bands had been signed, Rat, Motley, everyone was signed. So there was really no one to sign. All the New York City bands, whatever there was of those New York City bands, were like all... Johnny Thunder's clones, like junkie type stuff. Like um, everybody wanted to be Johnny Thunder's, you know, in 19, early 80s and be a junkie. And, and, you know, music was secondary. It was like, it was a very, I don't know. No one, no one wanted to mess with a, a scene that had junkies. It's just, you, you, you're just throwing your money down the toilet. You know what I mean? It's, it's very difficult. Anyway, so... There's really nobody to sign. New York really had nobody. So he he said to me, you should just start a band. I go, well, I never thought about starting a band. I'm not a, 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 a singer or, a, a, you know, I was I was a DJ and, and I like being behind the scenes and in the mix, but I wasn't, I didn't want to be in a band. I know, I never thought about it. He goes, you should start a band. We'll put out a record and find some cool looking guys and we'll just make a record. Because at that time, the distributor was doing so well and they had so much money coming in from distributing all this product. And for them to press a record was not a major deal. You know, you you owe, you always, in that situation, you're pressing so many albums and, and distribution deals and P&D deals and you're pressing so much product that you always owe the manufacturing plants money. You always owe them money. And they know they're not going to really get paid unless they keep churning out product for you. So they keep churning out product for you. And then every, you know, couple of months, the the label will write the pressing plan, a check for, you know, $300,000 or whatever. And that's just the way it works. So for him to press up a sweet pain wreck, it was not a big deal. And, you know, by this time I'm fully into cocaine and, and drinking and, you know, uh, you know, the, the guy that turned me on to Coke for the first time worked at IRD. So, I mean, you know, it was just every, it was all like incestuous, all of it. Uh, you know, drugs and alcohol were a huge part of music, you know, in those days. Uh, uh, again, you know, it's just a different world. Drinking age was still 18 then. So it's like, start this band. I'm like, Okay, so, you know, I, and I knew I couldn't sing, really sing, you know, uh, in, in the true sense of the word. So I didn't know what to do. So I, I got, the first person I got involved was Kelly Nichols. Kelly at the time was a roadie. He was a roadie for a cover band called Hot Shot. And Hot Shot was Bruno and Steve from Danger Danger. Those guys later formed Danger Danger, but they were in the main guys in Hot Shot. Kelly was the roadie and I was hanging around with all those guys because Bruno was a very good friend of mine from, you know, my teen years. So Kelly and I always got along, man. We always had fun. We always had a blast. We always made each other laugh. So, I, you know, Kelly at the time, he, he was a roadie, but he was he was trying to get into some bands and he, he played. He actually played a really cool gig. He played a gig for uh, as a party at Studio 54 for the Penthouse Pet of the Year, okay, uh, 1984, Sheila Kennedy. I have a whole thing about this in my book. It's a great story. Uh, there's a whole other part of it, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But uh, anyway, Kelly's band, and Kelly was in this band that played, I don't know, a couple gigs called TNA. They weren't, they didn't do anything really. They were maybe two gigs, three gigs they did. But Kelly's band ended up playing this party for the Penthouse Pet of the Year, which was amazing. It was just Crazy night. Anyway, so I said, hey, man, you want to, you know, start a band. Let's do this thing. I told them, I go, Combat's going to back it. They'll pay for the rehearsal studios. They'll they'll pay for everything. We'll just start a band. And he was like, cool. You know, why not? So we immediately said, let's just start looking for guys. Let's put an ad out in the paper. So I think we put an ad out in the Village Voice and newspaper in New York, um, an, uh, an arts weekly paper. We put a, an ad in there. We put a couple ads out 
And then we got a, um, and we told people, come by the offices of Combat Records, which is in Queens, right by Kennedy Airport in Jamaica, in a, in a area of just like a warehouse, you know, cargo area of Kennedy Airport. That's where the Combat Records offices and the distributor and the warehouse was. So we said, come, you know, we'll, we'll make appointments with people and they'll come down and we'll meet them. So, you know, we would spend days at the at the office there meeting potential candidates for Sweet Pain. Uh, guys would come in and we would talk to them. We wouldn't rehearse with them because we really didn't. I really didn't care if they could play or not. Honestly, after seeing Motley Crue play like on Shout the Devil tour, I'm like, ah, it doesn't matter if you can play. So, um, which is not true really, but that's the way I felt at the time, jacked up on drugs. So we met these people and we're just taking Polaroid photographs of everybody so we remember what they look like. And then on the picture, we'd write little notes, you know, and, you know, we just file these away and trying to, we were trying to find people. And then one day, I don't know how either they called us or we called them or something, but we got a call from these guys, these three guys that were all together out in Long Island somewhere, um, kind of like jamming around, playing together. Um, uh, and those were the other, the, these would be the three members of Sweet Pain, the, the additional members. Um, and we got together, we kind of all thought everybody looked cool. We dug each other. We were all on, you know, we all wanted to be under the same influences. We all wanted to have the same influences, which were basically a lot of kiss and, and, um, you know, the New York Dolls and all that. But also for me, it was also like the Sex Pistols and Alice Cooper and like edgy stuff. And, you know, you know, I was a big Sex Pistols fan. So that kind of punk thing was in the mix. Um, but what we didn't want to be is we didn't want to be, you know, Ingve Malmsteen and Dio and Dragons and Dungeons. And we wanted to be more like the New York Dolls and Kiss meets the Sex Pistols. That's kind of like what Sweet Pain was really. Um, so we got together and we started, you know, okay, we're going to do this. We got together. We, what, what's the name of the band? Uh, you know, um, I don't, can't remember who, but we were looking through albums and somebody said Sweet Pain and we we're like, okay. And, and, you know, some of the guys had songs, some of the guys had finished songs. We started rehearsing at a studio in Long Island called, uh, uh, I think it was Nino rehearsals in Baldwin, Long Island. We started rehearsing there and just getting it together. And we did it all so quick. Everything happened really fast. I got Kelly. We put an ad. We found the other three guys. We started rehearsing, getting some songs together. Um, we recorded the Sweet Pain album before we even played a gig. No lie. So that that's how it quick it all became because it wasn't about, A, for me, it was just like, why not? Somebody's backing me with money to do it and everybody's on drugs and everybody's partying and it's the 80s and it's just, you know, I was 23 years old. So it was this crazy time. So, you know, we, we ended up, we, we rehearsed, we wrote some songs, just enough songs that, and we went into this recording studio in Long Island, an island park called Studio 3973 or something like that. It's just like a converted garage. And um, we recorded that, we recorded all those tracks in two days. We just went in and recorded them. Was, everything was like one, one take, maybe two takes, maybe. And did it really fast. R Richie Rano got involved. Richie Rano is the guitarist in Stars. I had met him at a record store in Long Island called Slip Disc. And I was talking to Richie and I was telling him I'm a big Stars fan and I want to do a Stars song on this record and da 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 da. So, you know, I got friendly with Richie and then we decided to do Subway Terra because, you know, Michael Lee Smith, the vocalist in Stars, can really sing. So I, I knew I could never pull off most of that stuff. And Subway Terror was a little bit more gritty and street in New York. So we decided to do that. So Richie came in and, and produced the Subway Terror and uh, played some guitar on it and sang on it and really got involved in Subway Terror on that record. Uh, the record was produced by this guy, Eric Williams, 
who was in the band Dancing Hoods, which was a Relativity Records band. So he was part of the family, so to speak. Eric was, you know, he was African-American, and but the owner of Combat and Relativity thought Eric's musical sensibility would suit what we were doing. And he was right in a way. Um, Eric produced that record. Anyway, did that record in two days. Um, and then I think right after uh, we played a gig at Lemoore East in Queens, like on a Wednesday night, um, you know, there's a couple hundred people there. Um, and then shortly after that, our second gig we ever did was opening for Ace Freely at Lemoore in Brooklyn. Now, Ace had just come out of retirement. He had been way out. Of, you know, I think he left Kiss. I don't know when he left Kiss, you know, 82 something. And then he'd kind of like gone underground Ace. And then he came back and started doing shows. And we opened up for Ace at Lemoore, which was a crazy night. I mean, you know, A, we sounded like a train wreck, Sweet Pain, because it was our second gig. And we were like, like I said, the Sex Pistols meet Kiss. So you can imagine. So, you know, we did the gig. We got so much stuff thrown at us on stage. They were trying to yank us off stage. The owners of Lemoore, you know, I, I, I cut my head with a, a thrown bottle. I was bleeding. It was insane. It was just a crazy, crazy night. But it was like, you know, what was important to me was no one came to see the opening band, period. I don't care who the opening band was. They were there to see Ace. But everybody in that place was watching that stage because it was just like a train wreck. It was insane what was going on, how much stuff was thrown at the stage. Then um, after that, um, I flew the tapes, the master tapes out to LA uh, and mixed the Sweet Pain album with Randy Burns. You know, Randy Burns was doing all the thrash metal stuff for combat. So again, he, he mixed it with me, you know, I think we mixed the record in two days, two days to record it, two days to mix it, um, came back, turned in the tapes, um, you know, uh, then we did, uh, I can't remember if it was our third gig or fourth gig, but we did a gig in, at Lemoore in Queens that was just insane packed by this point people started hearing about us you know I was in the scene Kelly was in the scene everybody was starting to hear about the band and you know we would have crazy backstage parties you know just insane stuff the ba the backstage party was more important than the gig because everything was based around drugs and drinking I mean that's really what it was for 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 a lot of us not everybody in, in sweet pain was a, dr a crazy druggy guy but there was some that were um, anyway, we did that gig, um, packed. I mean, it was 2000 people easy at Lemoore. Um, and then we might've done another gig after that. And then shortly after that, Kelly Nichols said, Hey, look, I can't do this anymore. He, he wasn't digging it. He wasn't feeling it. Um, but I always knew Kelly had the personality and the ability to go all the way, you know, and, and get into a bigger band and, you know, and do you know, play the garden, which he did. Um, so he left, he joined a band called Angels in Vain that were just terrible, I thought. Um, another one of those Manhattan junkie bands, but that got him to LA and then he ended up hooking up with Faster Pussycat and then LA Guns and the rest is history. Um, but, uh, you know, the Sweet Pain thing, you know, the, the, we started out as a five-piece band and then after after that, L that Lamore gig opening for Ace, uh, we threw out the guitar player, Scarlet Row. Uh, and, and, you know, all I know is what I know. Okay. My truth, what I know, because I saw it and heard it, but the, the, there was three guys that came in. There was Scarlet Row, Adrian Vance. I'm going to use all their stage names and, um, Ronnie Taz. Those three guys came together. They were all one unit when they came in. Um, and when we fired Scarlet Row, everybody in the band agreed. And the two guys that came with Scarlet Row were bad mouthing him and talking him down more than anybody. So, you know, whatever history says out there, that's just the way it went down. It was like, you know, everybody's like, we got to get rid of him. I was like, okay. You know, I, I really didn't care. 
so much. But he was very, I don't know, I'm not going to badmouth the guy, you know, uh, but it just whatever. After two gigs, Sweet Pain became a four-piece. Then Kelly left, and then the drummer left. Ronnie Taz left and joined the Throbs, which had gotten a deal on Geffen, God bless. Um, and then I, Sweet Pain got two more members, a new bass player, a new drummer, continued on for a while, and then it just ended uh, because it was meant to end. It was never meant to be forever. It was of the moment and of the time. Um, you know, it just is what it was. And then right after that, uh, the owner of Combat and Relativity said, hey, screw this band, come back to work. I want you to, you know, do radio promotion for Relativity and Combat. Uh, and that's what I started doing. And then shortly after that, uh, he said, hey, I want you to be the director of promotions. I became the director of promotions for Relativity and Combat. And, you know, Joe Satriani, Surfing the Alien, came out and we promoted the hell out of it. A band called The Brandos. A few other big records came out and then Relativity continued till about, I don't know if it was 89, around in there. And then they made a deal and sold out to Sony um, for millions of dollars. Um, but, you know, I have all the Sweet Pain master tapes. I own the rights. Um, you know, you don't want to get into talking about rights because... There's lots of crossed lines with some of the Sweet Pain stuff and publishing and all kinds of stuff. But uh, the I have the master tapes. I own the two inch and the masters. And, you know, I've tried to put them out a couple times over the years, but nobody wants to do it for some reason. Uh, there used to be a Sweet Pain Wikipedia page, but somebody had it taken down. I kind of know what it's all about. There's a lot of still, you know, bad energy and, you know, whatever went down back then, people are still angry and haven't gotten over it and, you know, whatever. Everybody's on their own journey in life. Me, I'm way past all of it. Uh, you know, this is all, again, to document my stories for, you know, I've got a book coming out and, you know, working on some other things. So it's all about content and, you know, the crazy life I led. But look, that's, that's kind of the basis of the Sweet Pain story. Um, thanks everybody for listening and, and, and caring and giving a shit, uh, 1985 road dog. And, um, hopefully it won't be too long before I'll do another video. Speak to you soon. Thanks. Bye.